Welcome everyone. I'm back. I'm back from my 10-day trip to France, France, as I've learned to say. Um, it was fabulous. I'm a little bit jet lagged, a little bit longer than I normally am for an international trip. And so I'm hoping I can slap two words together in an orderly fashion and uh, keep my wits about me for this next few minutes. But I thank you for joining me. Um, let's see. We always start out with a little news about So Confident. And this month's project was all about making the willow blouse in Liberty of London fabrics. So I have the willow blouse on in a Liberty of London Tana Lawn cotton called Glastonbury. It's one of the special collections from Liberty of London. And this was our primary kit for the month. We do have a few left. Uh, two or three or four or something like that. So you want to check them out. Uh, yesterday, Erin put this blouse on. We're getting ready for another photo shoot. And she commented, and I'm not sure you'd have this particular blouse on, but she commented about how comfortable the fabric is. And I think that is just one of its unbelievable properties. Liberty of London Tana Lawn fabric is cotton, special cotton, made in a special part of the world, but it feels like you have on silk. It's soft, it doesn't scratch, it just feels comfy and wonderful. And really it doesn't wrinkle. So I think it's a pretty good travel uh, fabric, sometimes better than even like a viscose knit. We think of knits as being great travel fabrics when in fact this is, I think, probably a better travel fabric than some knits. So just consider the willow blouse in this particular fabric. We also have, well, I have to remind you that every Monday through the month of August, we are uh, presenting limited edition kits in color families. We, we have a couple, of, I think about three kits left of this, I think the most charming fabric called Bauhaus. And it certainly has that deco, Art Deco flavor to it. Little people, uh, little umbrellas, eyeballs. It's, it's quite charming. And so we have a few of these. And we also have three or four left of the fruit collage. I love fruit fabrics. I don't know why. Uh, pineapples and oranges and watermelon and figs and all kinds of things, but the detail of these fabrics it just sort of blows your mind. I mean, there's a lot of drawing and illustration that goes into the uh, producing of these particular motifs, and so the fabric or the fruit collage is a really fun one. So check those out. We still have a few of those. Another announcement is that we just received another bolt of this fabric. A few Facebook Lives ago, I showed you the cottage shirt in the Faces fabric. This comes from Europe. It's a wonderful cotton. It's not the Tonalon cotton of Liberty of London, but it's certainly a very, very nice quality cotton. We just got one bolt in, but for those of you who missed out the first time, we have this now, and you can grab a couple of yards, make yourself a cottage shirt or a willow blouse or whatever. But I think it's, again, a really, really, really fun fabric. And then this is the last call day for the black and white check Plissé. These are the Picasso pants that I wore a couple of weeks ago. And this fabric was a huge hit. So I can get more of this fabric. I have an order on hold that ends today. The, fa the factory in Belgium has been on vacation, or excuse me, on holiday. That's how they say it over there. And they are opening up today, so our order will go through. And so if you want more of this fabric, you need to email or call us like now, maybe like an hour from now. But uh, today, hopefully early in the day, um, because we are going to be shutting off our order but I talked about this fabric as being a great travel fabric, which it was. I took these to France with me, and I have not pressed them, washed them, or done anything since I wore them over there, and they look exactly like I put them in the suitcase and got them out and nothing changed. So the black and white is what we don't have and is on order, and you need to let us know right now. 
But remember that we also have the blue, and we have a bit of this left in stock. So we could ship this right out. I'm not going to be ordering this color anymore. I'm not taking orders on it. So last, last call for the blue that we still have, last call for the ordering of the black. Once the fabric factory opens up today, I think this order will go through pretty quickly, and in a couple of weeks we'll probably have this fabric. We have a list of those of you who have given us your yardage, and we hope we have a complete list. I'm pretty sure we do, because I'm not keeping the list. Somebody else is. And so you will get your fabric just as soon as we get it from Belgium. All right. So I had a friend, uh, Susie Lilly, from California, who after I got home from my trip, or maybe it was even before, said to me, why don't you talk about how successful your travel wardrobe was? The last time I did Facebook Live, I showed you the, I don't know how many garments it was, I should have counted, uh, nine or ten garments that I was going to be packing in a carry-on because I wasn't going to deal with lost and luggage and I just didn't want that little worry around my neck. So I'm here to tell you that I got lucky. Everything worked for me. I took one dress, two pairs of pants, one Picasso, the black and white check, one white viscose linen pair of Hudson's. I took a Eureka skirt, and then I took five or six tops, all in knit, cotton knits mostly, and I wore the dress once, I wore the skirt and the two pants twice. I think that adds up to my six or seven, eight days, whatever it is. And then with mixing and matching all the tops, I wore everything. I didn't not wear a single item. Took two pairs of shoes, that was perfect. I did buy a pair, you know, it's after all. But um, shipped those home. <laughs> So everything was just seamless, uh, including my travel, by the way. Uh, you know, we all complain about the hazards of traveling these days, but again, I got lucky. All my flights were on time, and I got to and from where I was supposed to go easily. Uh, it was perfect. It was hot when I got there, and then it rained, and it cooled off, and for the next six days, it was glorious weather in France, and we couldn't have been happier. So my trip was quite successful. We had a fabulous group of women who were all in. I mean, they had their fabrics. They were ready to go. They were receptive to the idea of making fractured in France jackets. We shopped at a wonderful store in Toulouse, bought some pieces that kind of filled in with what they'd already brought, and a few other things as well. And what was really cool about that experience is the store closes during the month of August, but the owner opened the store just for us. So for two and a half hours, we had the run of the place, and it was so much fun because everybody was pulling out fabric. You need this. You need this. And, oh, that's going to be perfect for my jacket. And it was, it was a great experience. So I'm home with a smile on my face and glad to be home. You know, it's always uh, wonderful to step back into the good old U.S. of A. Uh, it's, uh, and have ice cubes again. Love that. Uh, let's see. Uh, what else? Uh, and butter. Ice cubes and butter. Those are two things that I always miss when I go uh, to any other country. And it was nice to have that back home. All right. Um, so I want to talk about what we did in France. Uh, we did something different. Normally at Chateau du Mans in France, we do projects to anyone's liking. Pants, shirts, jackets, whatever anyone wants to make. But this year we had a focus, and it was based on a topic that we called fractured in France. So a couple of years ago, Kathy Davis made this jacket that I have next to me based on some ideas that uh, she had put together from the word boro, B-O-R-O. And in Japanese, boro means really mending and patching, and, and it's, you know, the Japanese were into recycling, upcycling, repurposing long before we ever considered it a topic here in the United States. And burrow pieces became work clothes, made out of work clothes, 
fabrics and other uh, kinds of scraps of fabrics. And they would sew them and stack them and layer them and stitch them together by hand to make a new fabric. And as these pieces were worn, they would add another patch. And so that's what this jacket was based on. So uh, Kathy made this jacket and we decided, and it was a project for So Confident Series 10 in October. But we brought it forward and decided to do the Fractured in France jackets in France. So it was the first time we kind of revealed all of the jackets that we'd made. Now, I can't show you all the jackets. I, can, I shipped four jackets to France. Samantha, who was my, Samantha Plo, who was my uh, co-teacher, shipped four jackets to France. She had more to ship, but she only shipped four. And we kind of divided our duties into the two techniques that we were introducing. All of those jackets are headed back to the United States in boxes. And so when those arrive and when the next time Samantha comes to Topeka, we will show you those jackets. But for the moment, this is the jacket I'm going to show you and I'm going to talk about the techniques. So I've, Kathy Davis and I have been experimenting with the basic running stitch or sashiko stitch for really a long time. Not that we didn't know how to do it. She and I, and I know all of you, grew up with needle and thread, stitching a simple running stitch. Well, uh, several years ago, Kathy and I went to Alabama Channon in Alabama, took a class, and it was all about stitching garments by hand through cotton, using cotton knit. And it got us kind of revved up about the whole hand stitching thing again. I grew up as a child making my own doll clothes by hand. And I, it brought me back to those days. And I remembered that that is something that I really enjoy doing, slowing down, sitting and stitching. Sometimes it's mindless. Sometimes it's creative. But either way, it's a very, very relaxing thing for me to do. And I have really enjoyed it the last few years. In the meantime, I've taken classes from other people. One of my favorite people is Mandy Petullo. And she has a couple of books out uh, published by Batsford. And her first one was Textile Collage. And I've done many, many, many pieces, but essentially it's, it's stacking fabrics on top of one another and adding some hand stitches. And this is just one of the little pieces that I've done uh, a few years ago. And I, I'm now collecting fragments of vintage fabrics and new fabrics. And then I took another class from Claire Wellesley Smith, who also writes for the same publisher, Batsford. And she wrote a book. This is her first book called Slow Stitch. Her second book is Resilient Stitch. But both of these books and all of the books by both of these authors are just full of fantastic ideas for creating uh, small pieces and even garments using a simple running stitch or variations of that. Claire Wellesley Smith keeps a diary. Much like you and I might write a diary or paint a diary every day, she stitches her diary. And so this was the beginning of my stitch diary that I started in France in, at Chateau uh, Dumas in her class. And you know she works out her issues through stitches on her basic fabric. And her stitch journal, she's rolled up and it's 10 feet long now. Every day she stitches on this, works out her problems or her happiness or whatever, however she feels. That's what she's stitching that day. And I love that process. I've also taken classes from another British uh, designer by the name of Richard McVettis, where he, I learned lots of variations on simple stitches. And this is just a little sampler of things that I did in his class on white wool. He generally works on this sort of fabric, some kind of a wool melton, uh, a soft, fuzzy wool. And it was from Mandy Petullo that I learned about this book. Now, this looks old, which it is. And of all the embroidery books that I own, this is my favorite. First of all, it's a little handbook that I can put in my little travel case of stitch materials. It's called 100 Embroidery Stitches. And it has to do with Anchor, which is a brand of 
embroidery floss. I believe that uh, they probably have produced this book. But, you know, it just, this, it just breaks it down into the simplest of drawings and text. And this is the kind of book I need. Just a quick reference of stitches. I don't need elaborate beautiful books to understand how to make a stitch. So this is my favorite book. You can get it on Amazon. Probably in its day it cost uh, 25 cents, but I think it's four dollars now. And it's going to be old like this and it doesn't matter because I like the fact that it's old. You can see I use it because I put my little post-it notes in there. So those are some inspirations. Um, and so the idea of the Fractured in France was to introduce two different techniques with an option, optional patterns, two patterns, either the London shirt pattern or the Chicago jacket. People were supposed to use those patterns and choose one or the other of the techniques. And what happened in France was uh, people got really creative and combined both of the, of the techniques, used some interesting materials, you know, you don't have to use like the old sashiko burrow stitching where you're using maybe some white sashiko thread or some white pearl cotton. You know, you can buy sashiko thread in a lot of places and even use sashiko needles. But I don't really do that. I'm looking for either novelty threads or basic threads. This is a little thread uh, made in Japan and it, it's cotton but it feels like paper and it's flat, which I like. You can go into knitting stores and embroidery stores and find some of these exotic threads. I love using wool thread. But most of the time, I'm using good old DMC thread, six strand thread that I'm using three or four, two, three or four strands. I'm rarely using six, but that's all an experiment. Uh, same thing here. This is thread by Alabama Channon. Uh, there are the equivalent of about seven of these skeins on spools. I think we still have a few colors of these left on our website. Um, I need to check that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that we carry a little bit of that. My favorite needle to use for my handwork is the Clover Gold Eye Embroidery Needle, sizes three through nine. Uh, this is my favorite, and I cannot stitch these days without a needle threader. I know you can't see this little wire loop on the end, but these are the best cutters that I have ever found. A woman makes them for us and I go through them somewhat quickly, but not as quickly as those little silver things that we get. Um, these last a lot longer and they are perfect, but with my eyesight I have to have some kind of a needle threader. So we sell both these needles and we sell these needle threaders and if you're into hand sewing I suggest you take a look at these. So, this happens to be the London shirt, and it has a burrow-like look, but it's really of uh, multi-layers and patches and so forth, but uh, it's really only two layers of fabric. So one, this is the applique technique. This is the technique that I taught in France, where you have a base fabric and then patches of fabric over it. And then Samantha taught a reverse applique process where you marry two layers of fabric. You cut out your base fabric per your pattern pieces and then you cut out another whole jacket and you baste around the edges and you do some stitching either by machine or by hand to hold them together in some sort of an interesting design and then you cut away portions of the top layer. We're just talking about the applique method today because that's what I um, used and taught. So. Um, we have a tutorial called Burrow Inspired London Shirt that was part of So Confident Series 10, that's last year in October. So if you were a member of So Confident last year, you have this tutorial. If you were not a member, we are going to be offering that tutorial today at a, uh, on, at a little bit of a discount and it walks you through the entire process of how to do this. Uh, this is a little side note. Just before I came into the studio, I got an email from Beth Werman in Iowa, and this was our kit in October, and she had a kit, and she made this jacket, and she won first prize at the Iowa State Fair for her beautiful burrow jacket. I thought that was really cool. So thanks for sending that, Beth. 
So basically, you cut out your base fabric. In this case, this is this uh, white and neutral sort of tie-dye looking fabric. And then these are patches of blue linen gauze. And in, in the tutorial, it tells you how many to cut. Um, I think there's like 50 or so pieces, various sizes that vary from three to four inches wide to three, four, five, six, nine inches long. But if you don't want to follow that, cut up some pieces, any shape or size. They don't have to be rectangles. They can be circles. They can be uh, triangles. They can be just shapes. It doesn't really matter. But whatever the shape, you need to adhere these shapes that you've already cut out to the base fabric. In this case, these are machine stitched to the base fabric and the edges are left raw. That's part of the intrigue of this is all of the raw edges. The more fraying, the better. And then you take a needle and thread. In this case, it's three strands of embroidery floss and you start doing some running stitches. And that is literally it. You can see here are some wonderful frayed edges. Uh, then the, the ja after you've done a certain amount of applique and stitching, then you can put the jacket together and you can still stitch on it even as a completed jacket. You could even wear it a few times and stitch some more. Uh, so that's one of the beauties of this particular process. I'm going to show you what I worked on in France. While everyone else in the class was far more productive than I was, this is what I worked on. Now, I always encourage you to make a little sample. This was a sample I made for one of the jackets that I actually took to France, where I was experimenting with whether these should be cut on the bias or on the straight of grain, how much they fringed, uh, my stitch length, the number of strands of embroidery floss, what colors really popped on this fabric. And everyone in France made several samples. Just made decisions about whether these patches are machine sewn on or hand sewn on. So this is the time to work things out. So I talked a lot about sample making and we posted, I believe, on Instagram and Facebook some of the pictures of the samples that have been made. So you can go back and see that and it's just astonishing what can happen. Now, I told the students to make samples. Did I make samples? Uh, no, I didn't. I just went for it uh, and so I found out some things while I was making my first front. So I started down here and I placed this uh, using some fusy web. I fused the uh, puckered placé linen and cotton to the base fabric, which is also linen. And I used fusy web on a couple of edges just to get it down. And um, then I machine stitched it. But for some reason, I didn't really like the machine stitching on this particular textured placé fabric. So all the rest of the patches are hand sewn on. It's like I basted them on with regular sewing thread. And I liked that better. But did I take this out? No, I left it. In fact, I might machine stitch a few more on another piece just to, I don't know, bring it back again. And then I decided I wanted to bring in a little bit of color. So I had a plaid fabric that I cut on the bias that brought in some colors and I just slipped those under the edges uh, just to add a little vertical and horizontal um, little pop of color to it. And then I started stitching and I started down here with a neutral color which happened to be this and up close I was really happy with it. I have horizontal and vertical running stitches and then I threw in some diagonals in what I thought were going to be contrasting colors. And then all of a sudden I put this on the mannequin at the dress form at the chateau and stood back. I couldn't see my stitches. I went, oh, well that doesn't work. So I dug around in the box of supplies over there and found a spool of pearl cotton in this dark, more burgundy color and stitched this up here and I liked it a lot better. So I'm not going to take this out. I will probably do some of this burgundy stitching down here and maybe some of this stitching back up here and maybe I won't. I'm not sure but this is the kind of thing that I literally wad up. Hand me that little sewing bag over there would you please Erin? This is the kind of thing that I carry with me. So here's my second front all rolled up, folded up with my little sewing supplies in a little bag and this goes with me everywhere. Sometimes my bags get more miles than um, even I do <laughs> uh, but 
you know, I've carried little bags of hand stitching with me on, on trips and, you know, it's a great thing to do if you're waiting in a waiting room or something like that or if you're carpooling and you have some time in your car, you can just whip that out and do some stitching. So essentially this is my first piece. Now the other thing that I decided to do was to hide the tails. Now I didn't start out that way. You can see I have some tails right there. And I decided I wanted a cleaner look on the back side. So through here, I can see I haven't cut one off, um, I pretty much uh, hid the tails. I didn't try to hide the knots so much. And speaking of knots, every time I would have just a little end of a, of a piece of thread, I would do some French knots. That's another stitch, thanks to that little book I have on embroidery stitches. So you can just you know, finish off your little strands of thread. But at any rate, back to the hiding of the tails. Um, I think this is going to be a little bit hard to uh, show you, but I'm going to try anyway. We'll see how this goes. It's hard to do standing up, and it's hard to do this fine of a work in front of a, an iPhone, but we'll see how it goes. So I have a strand of the pearl cotton that I've already knotted. And I'm going to just come in here off of where I want to stitch, and I want to go in between the layers and to the back side. Maybe I'll do it out on an edge over here. Let's do it. Let's do it right down here. Can you find me? There you go. Okay. All right. So I'm going to come in through between the layers and go to the back side. Every time I do this, I have to call Kathy, and she has to explain it to me again. So the knot is on the right side, just a little knot right there. And then I'm going to knot it on the back side. There's my knot. So then I can come up to the right side, right at that knot, and I can start my stitching. And I try not to be too perfect about this. I like the fact that my stitches are uneven. It makes it look more handcrafted. All right, so I'm going to go back to the wrong side. And I'm going to knot it. And then I'm going to run the tail, go down where that knot is, and I'm going to run the needle between the layers at some distance from that knot. So that now I get to cut a couple of things off. If I can find my scissors here in the bag, I know they're here. Hmm. Weird. All right, well, I don't know what happened to them. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to give that just a little tug, cut that off, and so I don't have a tail there, and then I can go back to the front side and cut this knot off, and I have a clean two knots clean except for the, the threads that have gotten all knotted up in there. Of course, this only happens on Facebook Live. Uh, one of the things that I learned at, um, at Chateau de Ma is they like when I make mistakes. So uh, stay tuned, there are plenty of them all the time. <laughs> all right, so that's uh, hiding the tails. That's just one little technique that I've learned to do that I really like. So, um, I think that's about it. Let's look at some fabrics. Are you have, we have any questions now, or do you want to, want to go to fabrics? Okay. All right. So, I put together some fabrics that I thought would make some really beautiful uh, borough inspired London shirts. And I started with this plaid. You have to think about both the front and the back of the fabric. Not so much for the base fabric, but for, but for what you're putting on top of it. Because if you're using raw edges, you want that raw edge to be attractive and not show maybe a, some white background on a very dark fabric 
unless you like that look. But you, I, I considered the fact that this is a woven plaid, and so it would look good on both sides. So think about this, perhaps, as a base fabric. And then they, these beautiful tonal colors of linen that could be patches on top. This is a cross-dyed linen that is gray and sort of a light cinnamon color. This is a cross-dyed fabric that is also brown and black, kind of a mocha brown and black. And this is a solid color uh, piece dyed piece of linen in the gray. But I love that whole look. You know, I, it's not fall here yet, but there is that kind of in the air thing about fall, and this just looks like fall. But then I pulled together this linen print. And I thought, you know, a little pop of that, either as a patch or sticking out, would just be beautiful. Um, it has the gray, and it brings in that golden color and the black. I thought that was just really beautiful. Or this could be the base fabric, and you put these fabrics on top of this. And just let a little bit of color peek out here and there. The plaid could be a, the patches on any one of these. So there are options here, but in my mind, I, I, sort of, I considered the plaid as the uh, primary base fabric. This is the Merchant Mills fabric. It's another colorway like the plaid that we used for the Hudson Pants variation for So Confident in February. So it's a really, really interesting and very nice uh, linen plaid. So this is the same fabric as the, that was used on, in the blue in the original Burrow kit. Uh, it's a crinkle linen. The, the crinkles stay. They don't press out. They don't wash out. And this is the fabric that frays really beautifully in a neutral color. And I think, again, that goes with any of this. To me, this is more of a top fabric, a second layer of fabric, than a base fabric. But the minute I say that, somebody's going to make the jacket out of this and put this on top, and it's going to be fantastic. So there you go. We no longer have the blue version of the original Burrow kit, but we do have the same fabric in a gray and white. And there are some other colors in here that can be brought out, including the neutral, uh, these sort of golden tones. You may not be able to pick up on that uh, on the camera, but there are some, some warmer tones along with the cooler grays. So here's a white linen gauze, the same one as this that could be the patches. You could throw in a little black and white, or you could do the black and white plaid as the base fabric with white patches on top of that. This, to me, this is what I used for my sampler, by the way. This is my base fabric, and this is the linen and cotton placé. And when I say the word placé, I really mean suck, seersucker. It's, it's permanently crinkled and puckered in the process of uh, weaving the fabric. So there's a lot of combinations here. Um, this is the base fabric that I use. I use these patches. But I think this would have been interesting had I been uh, thinking about it a little bit harder. This would be an interesting base fabric as well with these fabrics on top of this. And you disguise, not that I don't love this motif, but you disguise this motif and you just have edges of, uh, in this case, a little bit of metallic. Uh, it's like it's been drawn around the edges with a gold metallic pen. Uh, but, or this could be patches on top of this. All of these, to me, go together. The closest thing that I found in our inventory that goes uh, the navy uh, way like the original is these two. Now, this is a paisley design on rayon, on viscose. But if you put this navy blue linen patches on it, I think that's going to have a very similar flavor as the burrow and sashiko with the sashiko running stitches. So think about that in the, in the navy fan. But I also like it with these. You know, there's, there's nothing wrong with all four of these together either. So I think there's lots of combinations here. All of them linen with the exception of this bottom one, which is viscose and this one, which is visc uh, linen and viscose. Everything else is all linen, which I think has the character that we're after here, the Japanese uh, sort of uh, wrinkled, uh, work clothes, workhorse, uh, real you know, gutsy clothing, and I think, that's, I think that really brings out the flavor of the technique that we're doing here. Okay. Oh, I have one more. Sorry about that. 
So, you know, we always have our friends in South Carolina, Florida, Georgia, Alabama. And they like lighter colors. So this would make a wonderful uh, combination. Th these are two linens, this one from Japan, all linen, more of a handkerchief weight. And that could be patches on top of this. And imagine cutting out some of these shapes rather than using the rec rectangles as we've done. Or it could be reversed. Uh, this could be patches on top of this in a real freeform way or in the squares. So a lighter version, something for summer, spring, or year-round, wherever you live. Okay. All right, questions? Yep. Uh, we had a couple questions about the black and white gingham seersucker that we were talking about earlier for order. Um, what is the width and what is the price? Um, and I can answer that if you... Yeah, <laughs> if you, you may have to answer that because, I, yeah, I don't know. Um, the width is a little bit narrower, like 54? 40, 48. 48, okay. Um, and then it's 38 per yard. Okay. 48 inches wide. Would you just say 38 and dollars 38, yeah. per yard? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Okay. And then we had questions. So are you putting on the patches with a regular thread running stitch... Um, and a single thread around the outside? Yes. Now, this jacket was done with machine sewing, regular thread, regular stitch length. My sample was done with hand stitching, regular sewing thread, and a running stitch around the edges. So you can kind of mix up, you know, your different yeah. techniques. You, the, these, um, that was just a way to get these down. Uh, I could absolutely go over this with a more novelty thread, different kind of stitch. Um, some of the techniques that were used at the Chateau were a zigzag stitch, a um, um, blanket stitch, both hand and machine. Uh, all of the participants did the process like I'm doing, where they worked a piece at a time. Finish one, start another front, let's say. But one person, Victoria from London, made her garment first. And then she put the garment on a dress form and, in, and put her embellishment pieces on top of that. And there were, there were pros and cons to both. Uh, she could really see where the design was on her garment on a person, but it was more difficult to adhere the pieces because you're not working as flat. Uh, one of the more interesting ones, I thought, uh, was from Elaine Henry, who um, had this wonderful cotton piece that had a very ethnic flavor to it. Um, uh, all kinds of geometric designs and figures. And it had a more, uh, so what she did was use that as her second layer, as a great print with lots of colors. And she left all of the fabric in a more concentrated, area at the bottom and then cut some of those motifs out and sprinkled them and spread them out a little bit more as she went up the garment. I thought that was a really cool idea. Uh, Melinda from Oklahoma uh, used actually this uh, particular fabric right here with triangular and rectangular patches of the white and then inserted some pink handkerchief linen and boy it was beautiful and she free motion embroidered designs all over it. She's a quilter at heart, and she was, had all these fabulous uh, things going on, stitch, machine stitching wise. I don't think she was gonna let a hand sewing needle touch her garment. And uh, Sharon Scalise from Arizona uh, brought just a wonderful assortment of vintage linens from her family. I, th I would imagine that most of us have some sort of tub or box somewhere in our house that's full of all those laces and tablecloths and dresser scarves that our aunts and grandmothers have given us over the years and we don't know what to do with them. And she got those out, brought all of them to France, sorted through them, and then embellished her neutral uh, jacket using these layers of vintage textiles, including a wonderful dimensional corsage up at the top of her jacket. Um, who else? Oh, people were using silk, uh, taffeta on top of wool crepe, 
there were quite interesting combinations going on. Did you use FusiWeb to put your patches on? I used FusiWeb to put my patches on. Um, are we going to be able to see pictures of all these jackets that you're talking about? Well, when the jackets come back, uh, I think we do have pictures actually of the finished jackets that I sent over there. And at some point, maybe we can put together a little montage of jackets. Uh, but then the jackets that uh, Samantha made were so, so, so incredibly innovative. And she used the reverse applique process. And I just emailed her this morning to see if she's coming to Kansas at some point, And we'll see her talk about those jackets. So I think we'll get that all together. Uh, hopefully, those boxes make it. Uh, to Kansas and those jackets aren't landing somewhere else <laughs> but yeah what about doing most of your stitching flat and leaving the patches unstitched at the seams so you can place them over the seams after you make the jacket yeah you can do that um, this is a good example though of just letting some of the patches run off of the edges while they're still flat and then sewing a seam uh, but you, if you wanted to, you could pull that back, and when the seam is sewn, put that right over that seam. Not a problem. Can you show the inside of that jacket? Mm -hmm. I sure can. Why is it there's always one thread on a buttonhole that, there you go. Okay, so this is a very clean look on this, the inside of this jacket. <clears throat> you can see the machine stitching of the patches. And then you can see that the, all of the tails are hidden on the stitching. So it's a nice clean look. I made one that I'll show at some point, and I didn't pay any attention to what the back looked like. And I, it was pretty messy when I got done because I'd done a lot of techniques on it. And so I ended up lining the garment. But this one looks great just like that. And we have had a couple comments. Um, so we are having issues on the website, I guess. Um, our cart system is down. Ah. So um, we are looking into it. And so we'll just keep working on it. And it'll be up as soon as, <laughs> as, soon as it can. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Um, it was the lighting earlier today for the studio, and now it's the cart system. There's always something. <laughs> but it will be back. It'll be back. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Apparently that's, I don't know how long it's been going on. but Throughout the Facebook Live, but I figured I'd let you get through your presentation yeah. first. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, we did have a question about what exactly did you wear on the plane? Oh, I wore black Picasso pants in cotton lycra. And I wore a white Crane Street t-shirt. And I did take a very light linen gauze sweater that I did not make. I also took a scarf. Uh, and I wore my all birds sneakers. To and from. <laughs> Same thing. OK. I didn't count that in my ensembles for the trip, actually, because I knew it was kind of for airplane. It was never going to be in the suitcase. And you got it all? You ended up getting I did. I got it all in there. It wasn't even stuffed. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's summer, and the clothes are lighter, thinner. I got away with that. Um, we're heading to London in a month. I don't think that's going to happen this time. You know, I'm going to have to have a sweater and a raincoat, and I don't know. Things are going to be a little bit heavier. I don't see any other questions. Okay. You're going to go over the sale? All right. So the sale is, for the next week, all of these fabrics are on sale. The London shirt pattern, and that is both print and digital. And two... Uh, Two tutorials, the Burrow and Saab London shirt tutorial. That's an hour and a 15 minute video from 
So Confident October Series 10. But that's, that's, that you can now purchase that as a standalone class. And then I have a PDF uh, printable tutorial called Zaka Style. And that's where I put together all these inspirations of where you get great ideas for stitch patterns on garments. And it's just a really, really fun, uh, plus a, some, some techniques in there as well. But it's mostly an inspirational type PDF tutorial. That's on sale as well. So. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, I'm back, and I'll see you next Tuesday.